Today on the Matt Walsh Show, a school district in California is forcing its employees to intend so-called white privilege training. I'll tell you what this insane training entails. And also, I'll ask a pertinent question that people rarely ask, which is, when is a white employee finally going to stand up and file a racial discrimination lawsuit to stop this sort of madness? Because that's the only thing that's going to stop it. Also, five headlines, including more sheriffs saying that they will not enforce unconstitutional lockdown orders. And Warner Brothers gives the death blow to movie theaters. Is that something to celebrate? I don't think so. And in our daily cancellation, I will preemptively cancel any future potential COVID vaccine mandates and anybody who pushes for them. All of that and more coming up today on The Matt Walsh Show. So a report from Christopher Rufo, who's a writer with the City Journal, says that teachers in the San Diego Unified School District are being forced to attend white privilege training. Now, before we get into the details on this training, we should note that it's, it's no surprise coming from the San Diego Unified School District in particular, as this is the same district that made headlines not long ago, you may have heard, uh, for changing its grading system in order to, quote, combat racism. The district noticed that black, Hispanic, Native American students were failing more than white students. Rather than trying to rectify that by helping the failing students perform better, they decided instead to completely change the rules on the basis that the kids must be failing because of racism. Uh, I can tell you that I was not a very good student myself growing up. You know, I was known to bring home D's and E's on my report card. Um, If only I'd known that I was a victim of racism. I could have given that as an excuse to my dad. I ran out of excuses at a certain point. But something tells me he would have been unmoved by that excuse. And that's because my dad is not a credulous idiot, unlike the people running many of our school systems today, especially in California. So in San Diego now, final grades are based not on yearly averages, uh, and students are not penalized if they you know, turn in assignments late or don't show up to class at all. Bad behavior also doesn't count against them. None of that counts. The school board members who came up with this brilliant plan explained that now, now grading will be, will be based on mastery of the material. Of course, grades have always been based on mastery of the material, at least in theory. And the whole point is that a kid who's acting out in class not showing up half the time, handing his assignments in late, failing most of his tests, probably hasn't mastered the material, hence the failing grade on the report card. But that's not how it's going to work anymore in this anti-racist school district. Needless to say, as always, though, the attempts to be anti-racist are themselves extremely racist. The obvious implication here, what is being said without saying it, is that the minority students can't be expected to show up to class or behave themselves, so we have to change the rules to give them a shot. It's the bigotry of low expectations rearing its ugly head again. Racism in the name of combating racism, as always. And that brings us to the latest report. Uh, Christopher Rufo writes, quote, San Diego Unified School District is forcing teachers to attend white privilege training in which teachers are told, quote, you are racist and, quote, you are upholding racist ideas, structures, and policies. The training begins with a, quote, land acknowledgement in which the teachers are asked to accept that they are colonizers living on stolen Native American land. The PowerPoint slide says, quote, we must acknowledge the hidden history of violence against indigenous people in an effort to move towards justice. Now, hold on a second. Acknowledge? Hidden history? When is this not acknowledged? And how is it hidden? It is drilled into our heads at every opportunity that the white settlers were murderous land thieves. Has anyone not heard this by now? It's acknowledged, in fact, way too often and with too much hyperbole and with no sense of perspective. The history of the entire globe, every settled part of it, is awash in the blood of conquest. That was the case in the, the, case in the Americas before white people ever showed up. This land was being fought over. People were killed over it, brutalized, tortured, enslaved for centuries and centuries before anyone with white skin ever set foot on these shores. Does that excuse whatever sins any white man may have committed? No, but it does mean that our reckoning with history must include more than just white men, or else it's not a reckoning with history at all. It is a targeted attempt to scapegoat a particular race of people. It is racist, in other words. This is racist. 
And also, by the way, uh, just so you know, there is no such thing as Native American land. They were not one group. They were not a monolith. They were not homogenous. The Native American tribes didn't consider, oh, well, this is Native American land. We're, We're all together. We're all in this together. That's not how they saw it. They were warring tribes who, again, killed and enslaved and tortured one another with abandon for centuries. If land was stolen from anyone, it was stolen from whatever group just stole it from the last group. The idea that we have to look over this whole series of conquest and theft and place all the blame and moral guilt on the most recent people to steal whatever piece of land is just absolutely ludicrous. We, we, have, we have reckoned enough with all of the horrible things allegedly done by white people. Now it's everyone else's turn. You know, countless sins have been committed by countless people throughout history. Who's next in line for public repentance? We've got the white man covered by now. Okay, we get it. So can we move on from that? And uh, let's talk about the other other people who did bad stuff. Now back to Rufo's report. He says, uh, then they, the teachers, are told they will experience guilt, anger, apathy, and closed-mindedness because of their white fragility. After watching clips of Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi, the trainers tell the teachers, you are racist, you are upholding racist ideas, structures, and policies, that they must commit to becoming anti-racist in the classroom. They must submit to the new racial orthodoxy. The teachers are told that they are part of an oppressive white power structure, Uh, The trainers claim that, quote, white people in America hold most of the power and that white teachers have an ability to thrive that is being preserved at every level of power. Finally, teachers are told that they must become anti-racist activists. They must, quote, confront and examine their white privilege, acknowledge when they feel white fragility, and teach others to see their privilege. They must then turn their schools into activist organizations. Okay. Okay. Now, a few additional points here. First, um, there is one way to end this. I can think of only one way to put an end to this madness. Some white employee somewhere needs to step up and file a racial discrimination lawsuit. That's the only way this ends. Of course, there's no guarantee the case will be successful, given that far-left radicalism invades every part of our society, including the courts, especially the courts. But on the merits... It would be a rock-solid case. Here you have an employer singling out employees by race and subjecting them to degrading, insulting treatment and requiring that they accept and embrace this treatment because they deserve it. The employer is saying, you are white, and therefore you must accept that you are racist, privileged, and fragile. This is just so absurdly illegal and indefensible and in violation of every racial equality law and regulation that it hardly requires further explanation. Really, there's probably no scenario where an employer can say, you are fill-in-the-blank race, and therefore you must accept that you are fill-in-the-blank adjective or trait. It doesn't even matter what you fill-in-the-blanks with. Just imagine what it would sound like if this was being targeted towards black or Hispanic employees or gay employees or women, and the matter becomes clear. Second point, I go back to the same old drum I've been beating for years. Get your kids out of the public school system. This stuff is getting worse, not better. The leftist indoctrination is getting more radical, not less. We are now in full-on cult territory. What these teachers are undergoing is nothing less than cult brainwashing. Now, we hear about the kids being brainwashed, but we should also remember the teachers are being brainwashed too. You know, if you listen to people who've been brainwashed by cults, and then manage to deprogram themselves, they'll tell you that an important part of the indoctrination process is breaking the new recruit down, making them resentful of themselves, their families, those closest to them. The cult seeks to sever the recruit's ties, making them vulnerable, susceptible, in need of affirmation and connection. Then it's easy to come in, give that affirmation, and win their loyalty and their submission, more importantly. And that's what's going on here. The yet the left uses the same playbook. And if you send your children to public school, they are going to be in the clutches of these brainwashed cultist drones until your kids themselves become brainwashed cultist drones. So don't do that to them. Give your kids a fighting chance. Keep them out of the public school system. There are a million reasons to avoid public schools 
like the plague. And this is just the latest one. Now let's get to our five headlines. Before we get to our five headlines today, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who uh, normally would come on here and preach about diversity. It's not, it's not normally my bag, as you may have noticed. But one place where diversity is certainly uh, important is in your investments. You need to diversify your investments, and that means buying gold. Problem is that buying gold is really expensive. Uh, not everybody has the ability to do that. So here's something that you could try with our new sponsors, Acre Gold. Uh, if the, as, a, as the price of gold is skyrocketing, the new way to buy it is through this company called Acre. Acre lets you subscribe to gold bars for as little as 30 bucks a month. What you do is you pay each month, and once your gold stash reaches the price of their gold bars, they discreetly ship Acre Gold to your house, and so that you can be, you know, you can own gold, you can be an investor in gold, even if it feels like it's uh, it's an out of reach goal because you don't have the the money for it. Well, here's a way to do it. Acre keeps you updated on your gold stash every month. It ships uh, you the once you reach that price threshold, it's going to ship it to you. Again, that's in a really discreet way. Um, and Acre just recently also. We should mention introduced their new $100 per month subscription for their five gram gold bar. So you could choose what level you want to be involved in. But the idea here is to invest in something stable, uh, something that gives you some certainty for the future, uh, but also to do it in a way that's affordable for you. So you're not you're not you know you're not you're not stretching yourself too thin. I think this is the best possible solution. So visit getacregold.com/walsh. That's getacregold.com/walsh and start investing in physical gold today. Make sure you go to that URL also because Acre is giving away a gold bar. If you want to qualify for the giveaway, just tweet or post why you should be the recipient of the free gold bar. Mention at get underscore Acre uh, if you want to get that uh, free gold bar. Again, that's getacregold.com slash Walsh. And thank you to Acre Gold for supporting the show. So from the Daily Wire, it says, On Thursday, Los Angeles County Sheriff Alex Villanueva uh, reportedly asserted that he won't force his deputies to enforce a new statewide stay-at-home order against businesses issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, Bill Mulligan of KTTV tweeted that Sheriff Villanueva, quote, tells me he found out about the new state-at-home orders from Gavin Newsom's press conference. There was no coordination with local law enforcement beforehand, which he says is concerning when the the governor is expecting enforcement of his orders. Villanueva told KTTV, "Uh, I want to stay away from businesses that are trying to comply. They bent over backwards to modify their operations to conform to these orders, and then they have the rug yanked out from under them. That's a disservice. I don't want to make them more miserable. Mulligan added, Sheriff Villanueva says he believes the Lakers and Dodgers celebrations and Thanksgiving played a part in our recent surges, and that the civil unrest protests earlier in the year contributed to an earlier surge. Uh, doesn't believe that restaurants, et cetera, are to blame. Okay, so this is just the latest. We've, we've heard a number of sheriffs in, in various states, including California, come out and say that they're just not going to enforce these orders um, because they're wrong, misguided, unconstitutional, evil, um, and destroying people's lives. And that that's exactly what needs to happen. And, you know, I think that's a message that a lot of, I understand that the position this puts police officers in when they're expected to be the ones who go in and, you know, arrest a restaurant owner uh, for serving food. You know, that's a, that's a difficult spot that you're put in as a police officer. But there are times when moral courage is required. And this is one of those times. And I think if you're a police officer, you you also have to keep in mind that, you know, you know, you know, you've got one, one, one side, one half of the political spectrum that hates your guts unfairly. Okay. They, they they believe that you're racist serial killers on the prowl, hunting down black men to kill. That's what they believe. That's what they've been told. That's what the media says. And they hate you for that. Then you've got, you've got us, you've got conservatives who are standing up for you and saying, that's not true. Back the blue, all of that. Uh, Blue lives matter. I mean, that's all coming from conservatives. I think if you're a police officer, you really risk alienating your only defenders, the only people on your side, if you enforce rules and laws like this. So I'm glad that this sheriff has uh, chosen not to. Number two, article in IGN, it says Warner Brothers announced an industry-shaking approach to to distributing its films in 2021, revealing that it'll be making all 17 of its theatrically theatrically released titles uh, that year available concurrently for a one-month exclusive window on HBO Max. That means uh, U.S.-based consumers will be able to watch highly anticipated blockbusters, including Dune, The Matrix 4, 
The Suicide Squad, Mortal Kombat. Hold on a second. Didn't Suicide Squad already come out? Okay, I'm being told there's a new one. So they're making a new Suicide Squad and just calling it Suicide Squad again? It's not even Suicide Squad 2? But they're putting a the in front of it. So it was Suicide Squad before, now it's The Suicide Squad? I mean, it's unimaginative enough when you're doing these dumb franchises, but can you at least get a little creative with the title? Can you give us something, some kind of innovation? Anyway, so The Suicide Squad uh, will be released, Mortal Kombat, and a bunch of others. I think there's a King Kong versus uh, Godzilla coming out. All of that's going to be available on streaming. And apparently, um, if you're an HBO Max subscriber, as of right now, they're not going to raise the prices. So you'll get to see it for the same price you pay for your normal uh, subscription. A lot of people celebrating this move. Um, I don't see it as something to celebrate because it's this is the death of movie theaters, basically. We, we knew we were already heading in this direction, but this accelerates what was already going to happen. And I don't see that as a good thing. Now, I know the movie theater experience, and it's not like, you know, I, I have kids now and, and we have to get a babysitter and, you know, pay exorbitant sums for the babysitter and then you got to go out and buy the tickets and everything. It's like really expensive. So we don't go out to movies that often, but it's still a, I still like the fact that movie theaters existed and it's still an experience. And so what's happening now is that all of our communal experiences as people in a society are being taken away and it's all migrating to the internet. And one by one, what used to be an event, an experience, that you would, you would do it with other people out in public. It's all just something that you now do on your couch, staring at a computer screen. Yeah, even leaving aside all the jobs that are getting wiped out, so maybe that's the number one problem. But um, a, a strong number two is this, that these communal societal experiences are, be, are being taken away. And uh, I'm, you know, I think that's a sad thing. I think there will probably still be movie theaters but now we're only going to have the high-end ones where they charge you 30 bucks a ticket and they, they have to, you know, they like serve food and they're going to have to provide other things aside from just the movie, which is going to increase the prices. But it's not going to be like, like it used to be. I mean, even, even renting a movie, right, used to be a communal experience because you would go to Blockbuster, you know, um, and you would walk around the aisles for hours looking for a movie, fighting with your siblings, then you pick a movie, you bring it home. Um, you have to rewind it first because the last person didn't rewind it. That was an inexperience. That was replaced by Netflix and now, and now this too. All right. Um, we have a few clips from Joe Biden as incoherent as always. Here's the first one. This is Joe Biden explaining how he injured his foot because we never really got an explanation. He's been walking around in the, in the, the boot he injured himself somehow. We were told it had something to do with the dog. Um, no one told us exactly what happened. But Joe Biden yesterday explained what happened. And uh, I'm still just as confused as I was before. Listen. I got out of the shower. I got a dog. And anybody who's been around my house knows, dropped a little pup, dropped a ball in front of me. And for me to grab the ball. And I'm walking through this little alleyway to get to the bedroom. And I grabbed the ball like this. And he ran. And I was joking, running after him to grab his tail. And what happened was that uh, he slid on a throw rug, and I tripped on the, on the rug he slid on. That's what happened. Oh, man. <laughs> not, not, not very exciting story. I mean, it is kind of an exciting story, actually. Also kind of confusing. What, so what happened? He came out of the shower. So, now, so he's, he's, what is he, is he nude? I mean, maybe these are details we don't need. But he's the one putting the image in our heads. He's coming out of the shower. The dog is there. He decides to, so he grabs the ball uh, to, to play with the dog. And then he decides to chase after the dog to pull its tail. Is that a normal thing that dog owners do? He throws that in like it's something anyone does. Oh, you know, I was chasing it to pull its tail. What? You're a 78-year-old man. You're, you're, chase, you're coming out of the shower in a, in, a, in a towel, chasing the dog down the hallway to pull its tail. The dementia is worse than we thought. And then the dog slips on the rug, and then he trips over it and falls down. Uh, I'm not sure if I believe that this actually what happened. It's such a weird story. I feel like there's something. I don't know what happened, but I'm not sure if this is really what, what actually happened. But it is uh, uh, okay. I don't know what to make of it exactly. But I guess the lesson here is don't chase your dog to pull its tail. 
especially when you're just coming out of the shower. You got wet feet. Also, we got another uh, another another clip from Joe Biden. He, you know, you've heard of 15 days to slow the spread. You know, we heard about that. 15 days. Fifth, so there's a conversion. You know, this is kind of like a math problem. 15 days to slow the spread was really six months, seven, eight months, however long it's been now. I've lost count. Well, now Joe Biden is talking about when he, if, if he becomes president, if and when, 100 days to wear the mask. If 15 days is six months, how long is 100 days? I don't know, but here's Joe Biden explaining it. And I think my inclination, uh, Jake, is on the first day I'm inaugurated to say I'm going to ask the public for 100 days to mask. Just 100 days to mask. Not forever, 100 days. And I think we'll see a significant reduction if we occur that, if that occurs with vaccinations and masking to drive down the numbers considerably. 100 days. Why 100 days? Why not 95? Why not 102? Why not 300? Why not 1,000? Why not five? I mean, it's just a, a random number being pulled out of the pulled out of the sky. I'm just at, just just give me a hundred days. That's all. Wear the mat. Wear the cloth on your face for a hundred days. After a hundred days, you can take it off magically. Well, we know why he's choosing hundred days because it is an arbitrary number, and they think it sounds more palatable if they can just put a number on it. But if we do the conversion, like I said, this is a math. I, I already told you I was a bad student, so I can't do the math conversions here. But maybe somebody can. 15 days equals six months, so 100 days equals what? We're looking at years. And that's unironically probably the case. As we've been talking about all along, there is no limiting principle that I can see with this mask thing. Everything that we're told about masks, you know, uh, they're, they're safe, they're healthy. Uh, it's no big deal to wear them. You know, it's, you're protecting your fellow man. All, all of this logic applies, COVID or not. Regardless of COVID, all of this still applies. So if this is the reason, like we've, we've never really been given a COVID-specific reason to wear a mask. We've been given a lot of sort of general reasons to wear masks. And whether those reasons are good or bad, point is, I, they would still apply even if COVID doesn't exist. All right, our friend Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has earned some mockery again, this time for selling socialist merchandise on her website, which is already ironic in and of itself. But the best part is this tax the rich sweatshirt for uh, $58, $58 bucks for a tax the rich sweatshirt. Um, and I, I guess we really shouldn't call this ironic because socialists being hypocritical, socialists trying to profit off of socialism, that's par for the course. I mean, that's, that's a, a, a feature, not a bug. Completely expected, part of the package. Still worth mocking, though. And of course, you know, only rich people are going to buy this sweater. Saying tax the rich. Every person who buys this sweater will be rich, comparatively rich, I mean. I'm not saying that you have to be rich. You have to be a millionaire to afford a $58 sweater. But if you're buying sweaters with snazzy slogans for 58 bucks, that probably means you've achieved a level of wealth and luxury far above the vast majority of the globe at a minimum. In fact, if you're buying sweaters for 30 bucks, you, you've, you, you're probably in that category, as most people in America are. One other uh, AOC-related thing here. I enjoyed this tweet from her. She says, Republicans like to make fun of the fact that I used to be a waitress, but we all know if they ever had to do a double, they'd be the ones found crying in the walk-in fridge halfway through their first shift because someone yelled at them for bringing seltzer when they really wanted sparkling water. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, um, starting with this idea she has that working a double is some sort of some sort of a really impressive thing that very few people have done. But you think re you think Republicans have never worked double shifts? Um, I've worked double shifts. A lot of us have. It's it, it's 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 not terribly impressive, but also. This is such a specific scenario she's giving. Like it really sounds like this is a person with a lot of experience crying in walk-in fridges. I, I've worked doubles. I've worked in the food industry. Um, I, I've, I've never cried in a walk-in fridge. I've never been tempted to cry in a walk-in fridge. I've never seen anybody crying in a walk-in fridge. 
mean, that would be awkward if you just run in to grab the frozen cheese or whatever, and there's someone breaking down in tears in the middle of the freezer. What do you do about that? So this, this, this sounds like a woman, and no surprise here, but it sounds like a woman who did a lot of crying and a lot of walk-in fridges. My other question is, why the walk-in fridge? Of all, of all the places to cry, I guess, I, you know, I understand that it's an isolated place, but it seems a little, it does, doesn't seem like the most comfortable place for a crying fit. I mean, why not go to the bathroom for that? If it were me, now I've already made clear, men, of course, don't cry in general, especially not at work. But if I had to choose a spot for it, I would think probably the bathroom stall is the best place. It's not as cold. You know, it's more, more privacy. But that's, uh, that's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, I, I, I could definitely see that from her. She gets yelled at for... First of all, I could see her getting the order wrong and bringing the wrong kind of water and then crying because someone said... And it, it doesn't even have to be that she's getting chewed out about it. It's just someone says, oh, hey, uh, you, brought me, uh, you brought me seltzer. I wanted sparkling water. Then she just breaks down in tears and runs out of the room. Um, in any case, uh, by the way, Ben Shapiro is going to be ha, has more. Maybe not on the crying and the, the walk-in fridge thing. Maybe he'll talk about that too because it's a great topic. But um, the tax the rich sweater. Ben's been on top of this on Twitter, and he's going to have more on that. Uh, great perspective on that. So tune into his show for that. We've we've got one other one other headline here. Um, and in fact, maybe no setup is needed. I'll just show you this video if you haven't seen it. This is Cher, the singer Cher, uh, singing to an elephant. Listen. We'll come smiling through, no matter how your heart is grieving. If you keep on believing, the dream that you wish will come true. I. Yeah, I don't know why that's happening. Uh, the elephant's name is Kavan, if you're wondering who the victim is here. Cher, Cher flew to a zoo in Pakistan to sing to the elephant. You know, um, I don't know what the elephant did to deserve that treatment. Uh, you know, I'm not a big animal rights guy, but this level of animal cruelty is shocking to me personally, upsetting. Um, is this sort of some sort of punishment regime from the zoo. Like you step out of line, they call Cher up to come sing. That's really, really rough. It's not much different from the way that I punish my own kids, in fact, except that I make, if they're out of line, talk back or something, I make them listen to Beyonce acapella, uh, which is pretty harrowing. But, and then reading from, from more from uh, the Pink News article, it says, and just trying to figure out what's going on here and why this is happening. Um, I mean, this might just, this is share with them. I mean, this, is, this is just how she spends her weekend, I guess. She just goes around singing to, to elephants. But it says, after serenading Kavan, Cher flew with the elephant to Cambodia, where he was greeted by Buddhist monks. He had to be tested for COVID-19 before his flight. They need a pretty big swab for that, for that test, I guess. So she sang to him and then brought him on a plane to meet with Buddhist monks. You know what? I... Maybe it's best to not try to understand this and to just let it go right there. And that's it. Now is uh, definitely the time. If you're not a Daily Wire member, now is the time to do it because we've got so much stuff coming up right around the corner, uh, you know, bef- certainly into the new year, but even before the new year. Michael Knowles just, uh, just rolled out his five-day-a-week show with more content for members to enjoy. We're also adding the entire PragerU catalog to the dailywire.com. That's all going to be there by the end of the year, but we've already got some stuff there. Candace Owens is joining the Daily Wire, and she'll be here in Nashville. She's going to be launching a a new show with a live audience. We're excited about that. We're building an uh, an investigative journalism team. We're doing feature films. We're doing a lot of stuff. So if you want to go outside the narrative, you got to come over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. We're loud. We're opinionated. We're having a good time. At least some of us are over at dailywire.com. Um, and also, uh, this is not so much of a good time, but the Christmas ornaments we've been telling you about, if you want to hang us in effigy on your tree, you can text Christmas to 83400 to get your tree decorated. And I think even better than that, we, would, we told you about the, the, the Tax the Rich sweatshirt. Well, we've got our own. Two can play at that game, AOC. We've got our own sweatshirts. Um, so you can check out our new Insert Woke Slogan shirt. And so, you know, you can, that's, that's the good thing. We're, we're not going to tell you what woke slogan, we, we just whatever woke slogan you want. Um, that's the shirt. Our shirt, by the way, is cheaper than AOC's socialism sweatshirt. And you could check it out by texting woke 
to 83400. Go check out that sweatshirt now. Uh, now we'll get to our daily cancellation. So today we're going to preemptively cancel vaccine mandates. Um, this week, the Department of Defense released an image of the trusty new COVID-19 vaccination record card that you'll, you might have in your wallet. CNN explains, quote, vaccination cards will be used as the simplest way to keep track of COVID-19 shots, said Dr. Kelly Moore, associate director of the Immunization Action Coalition. Everybody will be issued a written card that they can put in their wallet that will uh, tell them what, what they had and when their next dose is due. Moore said, quote, let's do the simple, easy thing first. Everyone's going to get that. Vaccination clinics will also be reporting to their state immunization registries what vaccine was given so that, for example, an entity could run a query if it uh, didn't know where a patient got a first dose. Moore said many places are planning to ask patients to voluntarily voluntarily provide a cell phone number so they can get a text message telling them when and where their next dose is scheduled to be administered. Okay. Now, to be clear, they're not saying at the moment that you'll have to carry this card around with you at all times or that you'll you'll be required to present it in order to access goods and services. But there's a strong push in that direction right now with some major industries publicly toying with the idea. This is a live debate uh, in the airline industry, for example. And Australia's Qantas Airways has already announced that they will eventually only allow those who can prove they've gotten the vaccine on their flights. The same discussion is being had among schools. The Miami-Dade County superintendent has already said that vaccines could be mandatory for students next year. And elsewhere, you can find plenty of headlines. Like on CNBC, it says, can your employer require you to get a a COVID vaccine? Here's what experts say. By the way, they all appear to be saying yes. And then on Yahoo, should the coronavirus vaccine be mandatory? Now, all this makes it clear that vaccine mandates are not a conspiracy theory. This, th- there's a, a very good chance we're heading in that direction, and there are many powerful forces trying to push us there. As for the, gov- the government forcing us to get the vaccine, uh, that has also been discussed, but mostly in an, an intentionally indirect and confusing kind of way. For example, here's Joe Biden giving his thoughts on whether the government can and should mandate vaccinations. Tell me if you can make sense of this. We should be thinking about making it mandatory. How could you enforce that? Well, you couldn't. That's the problem. Just like you can't afford, you can't enforce measles. You can't, you can't come to school unless you have a measles shot. You know, you can't. But you can't say everyone has to do this. But you would, just like you can't mandate a mask. But you can say, you can go to every governor and get them all in a room, all 50 of them as president, and say, ask people to wear the mask. Everybody knows. And if they don't, fine. And they don't. No, not fine. Then I go to every governor. I go to every mayor. I go to every councilman. I go to every local official. Say, mandate the mask. Man, say, this is what you have to do when you're out. I don't know if you got that. Um, according to Joe Biden, the government can't mandate it, but they can tell everyone they have to do it. Isn't that a mandate? How do you define mandate if that isn't a mandate. But the ambiguity is the point. They aren't going to be forthcoming about their real plans and intentions, and they haven't been this entire time. And again, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's an observation. So, um, look, a a few things here. First of all, as for my own position on the COVID vaccine and any other vaccine, it's very simple. You know, I've never been dogmatic when it comes to vaccines. I believe that if you want the vaccine, you should get it. If you don't want it, you shouldn't get it. That's it. Um, it is perfectly sensible to make your make your own decisions, make them based on you know your own risk level. You may determine that you're at a very low risk for COVID. Not, not everybody has the same risk. There are some people in some demographics that have a very low risk. And so you may look at yourself and say, I, you know, I don't want to get the vaccine. I don't need it. You may decide that you're high risk and so that you so you do want to get it. Both of those choices are valid. Or you may decide that you're uncomfortable with getting a new vaccine that's been made so quickly. Now, you'll be treated like a wacky conspiracy monger if you you take that position now. But you'll remember that that was the position taken by Andrew Cuomo and many Democrats very recently. Cuomo said he wouldn't necessarily trust a vaccine rushed out, quote unquote, by the Trump administration. Many Democrats were very reluctant to say that they would get the shot if Trump was the guy in charge. 
Now, they've all changed their tune because they're anticipating a Biden presidency, but they said what they said. And they cannot credibly claim now that it's unreasonable to be wary about the very vaccine that they were publicly wary about not but a few weeks ago. But again, to my way of thinking, this is entirely up to the individual. You know, it's interesting that the people who normally scream about bodily autonomy seem to abandon that ship whenever the topic of vaccines comes up. Now, personally, I think that bodily autonomy is a basically nonsensical term. But if it could, if it could make sense in relation to any subject, it would be this. If we have bodily autonomy, then the government or anyone else trying to force you to inject a substance into your body must violate it. And bodily autonomy aside, I am simply in principle opposed to the idea that any adult in America should be required to inject or ingest anything that they don't want to inject or ingest. Doesn't matter what the thing is. I oppose it on principle. And I don't think that's some kind of radical libertarian position. One other thing to consider. If we do end up needing vaccination cards as a requirement for entry into government buildings, stores, schools, planes, invariably the people who support these policies and who who help to put them in place will be the same people, almost without exception, who would tell you that it's a horrific infringement on personal liberty to require IDs to vote. Requiring an ID to vote, these people say, is onerous, unfair, even racist somehow. Even though the point of the ID, the ID is just to make sure that you are who you say you are. That's it. It's not to ensure that you've done something or you've jumped a certain hurdle, much less injected or ingested anything into your body. It's just to verify that you are who, say, who you say you are. And yet that is too much. That is a, a great burden. But vaccine cards, we will be told, we're already being told, are totally different. Though, of course, the people saying that won't be able to explain how they're totally different because they can never explain anything they say. We are expected to simply shut up and comply, as always. And that is why the COVID vaccine mandate and those who push it are preemptively canceled. I'm going to get in early to cancel it ahead of time. It's the only way to be safe. And that'll do it for us today. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. 